Catherine, how, Hi, uh, how do we want to sh shall we wait? I don't know if, if, how well, we want we, to do that. We, well, I was wondering whether we might start. I'm, I'm conscious that there's, there's only 10, 10 of us, which is probably, not, you know, maybe because people are busy. And I thought if there's not that many of us, it's an opportunity for us just each to introduce ourselves, which might be a nice way to start rather than just looking at anonymous faces. What do you think, Narva? Just, a, you know, half a sentence each? Whatever you decide. That'd be nice. Should we start formally anyway? Um, well, welcome everyone. It's great to see, see you all at this difficult, weird time of year. We're all in various shades of lockdown, I'm sure. Um, I was going to suggest that we each introduce ourselves briefly, but perhaps Cornelius, you might want to kick, kick us all off as the current, as the current MD, <laughs> Dean more happy, and you might want to share your news with us. And if, do you want to say a few words first? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I, I, looking around, I think I see, know most of the faces here. I am the outgoing, um, <laughs> the outgoing managing director of, of, <laughs> of mine, <laughs> mine and Life. Uh, some people were afraid that you, they couldn't get rid of me, but um, it's not true. You are going to get rid of me. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I mentioned that simply because um, for those of you who weren't on, uh, you know, we're, I've announced this again in our newsletter that just went out, out today. But um, I've been involved with Mind and Life Europe now for 10 years, almost 10 years. And um, so I've had a, it's been an enormous privilege for me since we re rebooted in Europe in 2011, when I, I actually joined the board as vice chairman and had that uh, role for quite a few years and then was treasurer of the board and then um, sort of interim director and then co-director and then managing director. So I've had a chance to uh, experience mine in life from many points of view. And, um, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience and now it's time for change. And um, so that'll be, That'll be an exciting step for Mind and Life Europe next year. We are almost finalized my successor. And um, that person will be, it's been a long journey to find that person. And I, I hope we have that person. We're just in the last bits of negotiation and expect to announce um, that person very shortly um, who would start in January then. And I'll, I'll work with that person for a month or so. At any rate, um, lovely to see you all here. And uh, let me just take the opportunity not only to thank each of you for being part of this fabulous community for contemplative education and particularly to Catherine for her cura curatorship and leadership, but now also to Nava. Um, I'm really looking forward, Nava, to what you're gonna share with us later on. So that's a bit longer as an introduction, but um, forgive me for that. I'll pass the baton back. Thank you, Cornelius. Back to you. That partly introduces the whole thing. And we will miss you. Um, we've got 11 people now. It's, I think it would be nice if each of us just said the weeniest tiny bit about who we are. And I mean, do mean weeny tiny. I'm Catherine Weir, the principal investigator for this, currently sitting in rather gloomy old UK here, about to experience Brexit, finally. That's a bit, but uh, it's a great privilege to be um, having helped to lead this uh, community for a couple of years now. And I'm too, I'm really looking forward to hearing Narva. Um, if I just call out names, perhaps, if that's all right. Nimrod, I saw you. I'm going from right to left. Do you want to just say hi? Hi. Tell us who you are, where you're from. Um, Israel. I'm from Israel. Hi to everyone. Hi from Israel. Thank you. Albina, there you are. Unmute. Unmute. Let's get to unmute <laughs> <Okay>. yourself. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm Albina and I'm from Italy. <laughs> and you were, a, you were a volunteer for a while, weren't you? Yes, a, a little while actually, because then the the lockdown kicked in, and uh, but I'm really happy and grateful that uh, you have been keeping sending me the emails, so that I've been able to participate even in these strange times, and so be part of this community. Really, thank you for having me here. <laughs> I'm delighted. We, thank you. We've got quite a few people here representing whole school approaches. Uh, Nimrod does. Nimrod has done some great work in whole school approaches. And so also has Salah. Do you want to introduce yourself, Salah? Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Salah Marit from Finland. And uh, we are exploring and implementing mindfulness and self practices into, into Finnish schools. And I'm really 
looking forward to Nava's presentation and also sad to hear Cornelius that you are leaving and I wish you all the best to your future adventures. Thank you. Thank you. Brigitte, do you want to say hi? Yes, uh, my name is Brigitte Eigenmann. I'm sitting right outside of Zurich, Switzerland. I'm the head of human resources of an international school in the area, and we are looking at implementing mindfulness and social emotional learning to our school, also from a whole school perspective. Great. And so a lot of interest here in the whole school perspective. So that should be an interesting debate, I think. Thank you, Brigitte. Lovely to see you. Noah, I am here. do you want to say hi? Hi, I'm also from Israel and I work with the NAVA at the Purple School program. Well, wow, what a privilege. Excellent. Thank you. Wolfgang, do you want to say hi? Uh, thank you. Um, hi, <laughs> my name is Wolfgang. I am in Graz in Austria. Um, like Adina, I've also been a volunteer uh, for a part of the year this year and keep on still returning, <laughs> of course. And, and it's, yeah, it's also a great privilege to be if you look forward to the presentation by Nava. Indeed, we're all excited about this. Um, Nina, I saw Nina here, I think. Nina, do you want to say hi? Hi, hello everyone. I'm Nina, I'm based in Munich, Germany, just before the probably next hard lockdown. Um, and yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the presentation and in general as a communications manager at Minor Life Europe, I'm trying my best to support each of you to support the community and the different initiatives, as well as the newsletter that just went out <laughs> and the Facebook and social media accounts. So happy to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. And Uta? Um, still Uta, still living in uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So um, happy to be here, of course, and happy Hanukkah to all from Israel. So I think we just start right now. Thank you. Looking forward, Nava. Okay, have I, have I got everyone? Have I missed anyone? Shall we just sit for a minute or half a minute together just to get us in the zone? Is that all right with you, Nava? I'll just sound the bell. Great, lovely. Okay, in a moment I'm going to hand on over to Nava, who we're very privileged to be hearing from. She's director of the Segal Center for Brain and Mind in Israel. And I particularly love a little sentence in her biog, which is on the Mind and Life Europe website. Um, she runs the center from a deep belief that neuroscientists are not only capable of, but obligated to make the world a better place. And I think we can all, we can all say, say yay to that at the moment. So I'll let you do the more detailed introduction if that's all right, Nava. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we put any questions that occur to us as Nava talks on the chat function. So pop those in. And I know Nava's going to talk for 20 minutes or so and then, or quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, Nava, and then break at a natural break. Um, and I will field the questions then, but I'll, I'll be inviting you to put your own question, but it's just nice for me to see what people are asking about. So to perhaps organize those. Okay, is that everybody all, all set? Everybody, no one's got any questions. Right, I shall mute myself. The world will be glad to know. And over to you, Nava. Hey, thank you, Catherine and Cornelius. Um, I'm, uh, I remember meeting at Rotterdam and I regret that it was so short, but I hope we'll, we'll see you in other, other um, circles. And thank you for all the things you did until now. Um, so um, 
my talk is like divided into three parts. A, a part that is a little bit giving the context because I feel that the context is important here. And then um, very short details on the program itself. And then more on how we, you know, this, like more the strategic thinking about um, how we how we see the program as part of a um, way to, uh, to, uh, to to think of how we really um, impact in a larger scale. So I'll stop after the second part, okay? And just to say that it, we don't have a lot of time, and I have a lot of things I would like to share. So I just like you know put like pointers, and um, if anyone is, and I know there's people here that are uh, doing really serious work. So if um, anyone wants to talk and share later, then um, the idea is to just let you know, you know, things that we're doing and things that that can be points of connection. Okay, that's the, the point that for me, that's one of the goals of this talk. <clears throat> okay, so I'll share. So um, do you see my presentation? Yeah, okay. Um, I just need to make you on my second screen. Okay, great. So um, just like to give you some context, um, just first of all, geography. So we are situated in the inter, I'm sitting now in the interdisciplinary center. Actually, I'm sitting here in this office right now that you can see where I'm pointing. <laughs> I have a view, I can see the, the Mediterranean Sea far away. Um, and this is 50 minutes north of Tel Aviv. It's uh, in a private university, the only private university in Israel. It's called the Interdisciplinary Center um, in a city called Herkia, small city. Um, and I run the Segal Center for Brain and Mind. So it's a neuroscience center. And in the last years, it's really focused mainly on understanding healthy states of mind. And mindfulness is a very central um, subject of inquiry and we have all kinds of tools that we're using both from psychology and from neuroscience. Um, and um, in when I came here a little bit after I came here, um, we had to buy a, a house. I mean, we decided to buy a house and um, a, um, a few uh, days before we had to sign on the contract, um, my husband and I were looking at one another and we're like, are we crazy to buy a house in this crazy place that was before all the world went crazy um so <laughs> but we were like you know this is this place is hopeless you know there's so much um there's so much hatred and there's so much um suffering here and there's so much uh difficulties and um i don't want to criticize you know i, I think it's a complex situation what's happening in this part of the world but um um, at some point, uh, we decided that we we will probably will stay because this is where we live. This is you know where our life is. This is where our family is, and uh, you know the good part of Israel is family and friends. There's a lot of connection here, and um, and that's where I decided that if I'm staying, I have to do something um, to take responsibility for my children's future, and um, and then um, although I was in an early career <laughs> in my scientific career. Um, I opened uh, what's called the Muda Institute for Mindfulness Science and Society, which is a social dissemination center inside the Neuroscience Center, a little bit like Richie Davidson Center. And, um, and since then, we've been trying to do impact in Israeli society. So the um, main areas of, of, you know, of trying to do something is First of all, of course, education, you know, if you want to make change, you usually want to do impact in education. And this is where I'm going to share with you today. We also um, have a center for training, what we call training change agents. So we brought in the MBSR and MBCP from England, from Bangor University, and um, we translated it to Hebrew and we give uh, scholarships. And today we have Arab uh, teachers on the way and people from the Ethiopian community and from other communities. And the idea is to really try to bring mindfulness into all Israeli communities, especially the marginalized and the peripheral communities. Um, and um, we also um, try to do a lot of cultural adaptation of mindfulness, for example, with the Ethiopian community. Uh, so we have uh, Jews that came from Africa and they suffer from uh, similar things that a lot of um, um, Afro-Americans 
suffer or people of, of color. Um, and we do um, cultural adaptations to um, ultra Orthodox, to Arabic and different, different cultural groups. We have a lot of groups here in Israel. And we do a lot, a lot of dissemination um, and research that's supposed to really help people in Israeli society understand that mindfulness is something really serious. There's a lot of science around that and it's something that can really, really be helpful. Um, when we started in 2009, we were the first, I did the first conference. Um, I forgot the pictures. So uh, <laughs> um, we already trained more than 200 um, teachers, MBSR and MBC teachers. And we brought a lot of uh, people. John kabat was here in Israel, Richie Davidson. Um, here you can see some of these people. And when we started, Richie was in the first conference in 2009. We was the first time that people heard that mindfulness has to do with science, you know. Um, and since then, I think today in Israel, most of the people know that mindfulness is something that's scientifically based. And I think uh, Nimrod can um, really, uh, you know, um, give some kind of, uh, of, of support for this, that we've did, done a lot of things about uh, uh, regarding how people in Israel um, look at mindfulness um, today. So these are people that came to Israel. And we also do um, work on the interface of contemplative neuropedagogy and how through neuroscience you can actually um, help people see that they can actually change themselves and take responsibility of who they are and, 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 and in their children and, and know um, how, how they are in the world. So um, we also have work on that. We also have work on, on trying to um, um, connect between mindfulness and conflict. Um, and um, we just finished the study that actually the COVID interfered somehow, but we still have a nice result on how um, we, we have a, um, a, a um, program that's called Mind the Conflict, where we give tools to um, be able to lead volatile conversations. And we did a really nice study that was actually funded by the Mind and Life um, and in four Arab schools where we we give teachers the tools to lead volatile conversations and then they work with their students and we um, measure the monitor the effect of this intervention. So we're very interested also in this kind of how mindfulness can actually support the different conflicts here in this, in this region. And uh, in regarding the education, so um, I did think that I'll take a minute to just to, to like tell a, bit, a little bit about the history because I think it's it is interesting to see, you know, how things evolve, and I'm sure a lot of people that will um, that are here or will listen to this um, have similar experiences. So, you know, in the beginning, we were like in 2009, we were like, let's go to the schools and bring mindfulness into the schools to the to the kids. And very soon, we we realized, yeah, like everybody in the world, that you have to work with the adults. But also there, so we did a lot of work and we also developed a lot of things, but, and I think we worked with more than 1000 teachers in different schools. But then we realized that actually if we go out, we do this work, there's nice effects, we go out and everything just dissolves. And um, it's not really doing impact. So this is um, how the purple schools were born and we understood that you really have to go into a school and do some deep work and you, you had to do a whole school, it has to be longer processes. But then um, came you know, the question of, of, okay, we go to a school for three years and we do a whole school program, but how do we do an impact on, the, on, 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 a, on a larger scale? And, um, and, and, and then um, when, we, when did, we did fundraising for this program, um, and we actually fundraise from a um, organization that does a lot of work in education in Israel. And they gave us a suggestion that was surprising for me because when I went to fundraise for them, I gave them a program on how in five years I enter a hundred schools, you know, <laughs> and, and they said, no, this is, a, this is a mistake. If you wanna do impact, you have to go slow and um, you have to build capacity to, to scale and you have to build capacity to do things that are sustainable because now you're, you have all the greatest people with you and you can do the amazing things in a few schools, but the moment you wanna to go to a lot of schools, 
um, you won't be able to sustain the implementation and the level that you're doing right now and everything will collapse. And we've seen it so many times. And they really, they, they said, we'll give you money, but we'll give you money if you do it wisely. And if you build the capacities and actually if you teach or, or you build um, models that can actually help other organizations also scale or also um, um, work more strategically when they think about one day to be able to scale. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program because um, although I think we have a great program and we did a lot of development and curriculum and a lot of things, I also know that there's a lot of other great programs in the world. And of course, we're very inspired by a lot of things that are happening. And I am assuming that, um, you know, um, at the end, the programs have a lot of similarities um, in a lot of points. So, uh, you know, I don't need to give all the small details. But again, I want to say that if people are interested in specific things we're doing, I would really be happy to share. So I'll take a few moments now just to like, explain first of all the theory of action and then some details about the program. So um, one of the things that we realized and it took us a lot of time to realize um, that before we go into mindfulness and before we go into social emotional learning, there's one deeper layer that needs to be attended and it's that the needs of the people in the school need to be fulfilled. And people, for people to do, uh, to do a journey that is required by mindfulness and social emotional learning, they need to be available. They need to, be, to have resources. And if people are not available and they don't have resources, nothing, there's nothing to, do, to, to even start, right? So um, one of the things that we give a lot of attention in our program is for, first of all, to, to the fact that people need that their basic needs will be fulfilled and not frustrated. And, uh, and, and the needs are, um, um, can, you know, there's all kinds of ways to, to, to name them, but we take the, the self-determination theory um, um, suggestion and that's uh, needs of autonomy, competence and relatedness. So this is like the basics. And then if that's, if, 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 the, if people's needs are, um, you know, are addressed, then they can start cultivating mindfulness. Um, and they can, can cultivate acceptance and you know, being present and kindness and compassion. And here we're very much inspired by MBSR, which is like I said, one of the things we do in our center. And we also understood that ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy, has a lot of um, ideas that could be very relevant for teachers in school, especially when we know that um, in, in terms of practicing um, it's not very easy to bring teachers to really go into very deep practice. So you need to really give them all kinds of, um, you know, um, structures that can help them sustain some kind of a mindfulness practice. And these kind of things are actually, it's like a loop because mindfulness also supports needs. And there's a lot of literature about that. If, if anyone is interested about the relationship between, between mindfulness and, and um, need support. Um, and then, this, these kinds of, you know, with needs are, are, are fulfilled and mindfulness can be, can be cultivated, then you can go also to start to talk about values and committed actions. And again, we're very inspired by accepting commitment therapy. And we really talk about that with the teachers and with, with the school about, you know, what are, you, what are the values and the school values and, what are the, um, and how we can use the mindfulness schools for committed actions and orienting the school towards an ethics of care um, uh, for the development of the whole child and also the well-being of all the inhabitants of the school. And the change um, um, is that, that we're, we're, we're talking about change that is multi-level in all the levels of the school, in our whole school approach, including the school ethos, the language, the practices. And we don't so much focus on curriculum and specific cell or mindfulness curriculum, but we Actually, our goal is that the pedagogy in the school will become a contemplative pedagogy. So every class, every lesson would have a contemplative um, uh, feature for it. So it doesn't matter if the child learns mathematics or geography or history 
or literature, there would be a contemplative part uh, in, 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 in the class. So we don't so much um, um, aim for teachers being able to um, teach the, the students to, to, to have a mindfulness practice, so, um, but more being able to introduce contemplative pedagogy. This is the aim of the, um, so the, the teachers themselves have a mindfulness practice, but not necessarily the kids. The kids more have, um, have opportunities through contemplative pedagogy to meet themselves and to, um, and to cultivate uh, actually social emotional competencies. And um, we are, and, and here we are working with the C model. So we're not using their curriculum, but we're really inspired by their model. So their model is like um, when we develop our <clears throat> um, uh, contemplative suggestions for contemplative pedagogies, we really put a lot of emphasis on the C model. Okay, so this is the theory of action um, and the theory of change. And we believe that. Um, um, this, you know, if we attend to all these levels, then we can reach a situation where the school culture and, and climate are transformed and it's something like deep in the DNA of the school. So we put a lot of emphasis on language um, and culture and practices. And the idea is really to, um, like we call it, to color the, everything in purple. So this is also an opportunity just to like give you a brief um, a view of, of the team. So the team is led by um, Tamar and Amos and Noah, who, who's here. And Tamar is, is the, the head of the, more like the, the, the development, the pedagogical development. And Amos is more the managing director and Noah is um, leading the, um, the, the evaluation of the program and you see all the other people that are part of the R&D and part of the team that actually is working in the schools. And we don't, um, we, we, we're now in the second year, uh, well, we can say it's between second and third year and our aim is to reach max 20 schools and each school to be a very different school. So we're, the, the aim is to be, this is a phase of learning and not so much of, you know, going to scale. So how does the, um, how does the program look like? So um, it's a whole school intervention, it's a three year. And in the first year, all the staff, that means teachers and um, principal um, um, have a mindfulness training of 30 hours. We work with the, within the restraints of the education system in Israel. So in Israel, um, teacher training is 30 hours <laughs> a year. Um, and the principal and what we call the purple leaders. So it's a group of, of, of teachers, counselors that the principal chooses in the beginning or they cho choose themselves, but every school has to have a group that we call them the purple leaders. The purple leaders and the principal um, have a mindful leadership that's 40 hours. Um, and um, throughout the year, there's a coach that comes into the school and works with the purple leaders um, once um, once a month. So the purple leader, the mindful leadership is also once a month <clears throat> for four hours. The second year looks similar, but now um, all the all the teachers um, go. They now learn mindfulness in school. So this is applications of mindfulness in pedagogy and in meetings and and you know how do we apply. A mindfulness contemplative practices. So um, it's more like a con how do, the contemplative practices, how we can apply them in the class, in the school, in all kinds of settings in the school. The principals and the purple leaders go to a mindful leadership two, number two course, and again, coaching of the purple leaders throughout the year. And in the third year, there's an advanced mindfulness in school program. Um, and, um, and also advanced um, uh, uh, mindful leadership and the coaching continues. So the idea is that we first give the adults in the school the, 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 the mindfulness skills. When we say mindfulness, by the way, we mean mindfulness, compassion, really, um, it's like a, a word that we actually mean a lot inside it, but the, 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 the adults uh, receive skills and then they receive 
um, the they they receive training and how to um, apply these abilities inside the school in different settings when they work with the kids when they teach in the pedagogy when they have pedagogical uh, meetings when they have staff meetings you know everywhere so they also have we also develop a language and uh, work with the purple leaders seems to be a very central we're learning that seems to be a very central issue because the purple leaders are actually the early adapters and they're also the ones that are also that really help implement um, all these ideas inside the school so um yeah so i think this is so yeah so, like i said the idea is to really slowly slowly color everything in the school in purple yeah so it's the language it's the culture it's the practices it's the pedagogy it's the it's the way they work with the with the parents um so that's the idea yeah so i think we can stop here for for a moment and like if you have questions before i go to the second part okay i've unmuted myself and i've got a question which i'll just kick off with but please if other people just want to ask one just wave a hand if i can see you all you something you hinted at nava was really interesting for me which is you said teachers are very busy and they need the practice to be very um, accessible i got the feeling you know that they they, they need it to mean something to them immediately. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what you were you were saying? Because that's so, something that's interesting me. How do we how do we make practice which can seem rather monastic and slow mean something to busy teachers? Is that something you've got some advice for about? Um, so um, we we are we are humble in the first year and we don't uh, we we don't you know, we have low expectations of ha ha having them practice at home. So we do, have, we do the practice inside the um, training themselves, but we also use a lot of acceptance commitment therapy ideas, which um, give a lot of motivation for people to try to implement, um, you know, ideas of mindfulness in, in their daily uh, life. Um, so I think one of the things we, we really, went i think through all the um possibilities we did things that are closer to mbsr and then farther from mbsr and then um you know specific things we developed and 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 we actually came back more to things that are closer to mbsr with a lot of acceptance commitment therapy ideas inside them which um enable a more like co the, like a first level cognitive understanding and then slowly slowly people more and more start um, you know, incorporating. And like I will show soon, one of the things we realized is that for things to happen in schools, um, teachers have to have internal motivation for, for mindfulness and for practice. So we actually put a lot of emphasis on that, on how do we create internal motivation. And here we are really uh, inspired by the motivational theories that say, if you want internal motivation, you have to be sure that people feel related to the idea. They have to feel um, um, autonomous that they chose and they um, need to um, feel competent. So um, we put a lot of emphasis on how we try to let the teachers feel yeah, that these needs are actually fulfilled. And through that, hopefully, there will be more there, there's more motivation to be more engaged in all you know in practices and other things that are happening in the school okay thank you and we've got another few clarification questions brigitte do you want to you've got a couple of questions do you want to put them directly to nava thank you catherine um nava um and it wasn't clear to me during your presentation in which of the three years um, faculty actually starts to teach kids. Mm -hmm. So, um, or is the whole three years about adult training still? No. So, um, if we go back to here, the first year is a year that's more internal. So um, the teachers, it's more about their own practice. We suggest things to do in school. We actually really, um, we really, um, you know, try to give them all kinds of suggestions, but it's not expected. Um, and then in the second and third, the mindfulness in school 
The mindfulness is cool is, is specifically um, about practices to do in the school, uh, in the pedagogy, in the class, in the recess, um, in the staff meeting. So it's more, so the mindfulness in school the program is really already about hands on with the, with the kids. So there so, they so the faculty would learn. Mm -hmm. and they would apply it in the same yeah. year okay yeah. they apply it and they get feedback and the idea is that they um and they're you know they get supported and then in the third year the idea is that we help them become um developers so they can actually not only take our ideas but also start bringing from themselves so the idea is that when we go out of the school the school has um, their own, they're already uh, an ability to actually develop these kind of ideas and not only use a specific curriculum. Thank you very much. It's clear now. Um, and my second question would be, in, in my school, the faculty are all over the place. There's clusters that would be very intrinsically motivated and other clusters that say this is all too esoteric. Yeah. And I find peace by going on a mountain hike and certainly not sitting on a cushion, closing my eyes. Mm -hmm. So uh, a big question for me is, do we make this mandatory as a school and just live with the fact that not everybody is hugely motivated? Mm -hmm. Or do we, as I also hear from uh, external consultants, say this is utterly... Um, non-mandatory and we just start with the people that are motivated and count on mouth to mouth propaganda and mm -hmm. let it organically grow what would you advise and how do you do it in, in your purple mm -hmm. school program so, you know this is the million dollar one of the million dollars question right in this world of mindfulness and education um and um at the moment and i i think we you know we still also have this open but at the moment, the idea is to go into schools where um, at least, uh, you know, the principal and a, um, a, a significant group has voted to go and become a purple school. Um, so, they, so there is a few individuals that, you know, didn't vote for that, but in the, and, and we don't, we usually don't recommend that it would be mandatory for them, but um, Usually, you know, the principal is supposed to have some kind of a leadership ability to somehow, you know, um, um, motivate. But as I was showing the second part, we actually try to specifically um, address motivation. So this is the self-determination theory that this is like a part that we, this year, like this was like the last latest uh, understanding in the program that we have to address motivation specifically and directly. And I'll show how we are trying, starting to do that. So maybe I'll, I could give a, like a, a more longer answer in a few moments. Okay, thank you. Nimrod, you had a factual question, I think. Nimrod, we can't hear you. <laughs> Unmute. No okay. Um, one question is more technical uh, relating to the 40 hours and the 30 hours. Is there an overlap in context of people? Are some people getting both? Is one question. And I didn't understand again. In your chart. Yeah. Every year. Let's take the first year. You have the, the purple leaders receiving 40 hours. Yes. You have teachers receiving mindfulness training 30 hours. Is there an overlap? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the principal and purple leaders have to be in, in, the, in all the mindfulness, the base, you know, in all the mindfulness training. So um, the purple leaders actually have 30 plus, plus 40. And recently we were able, yeah, the, the purple leaders have 30 plus 40. And recently we were able to um, get accreditation for them. So this is one of the advancements the Ministry of Education actually um, enables us now to give them for 30 and for 40 hours. So this is an advancement, but in the beginning they did it for volunteer. I mean, they didn't get accreditation for that. And I have a second question, uh, which I didn't type. Um, as you know, as we know, the original Israeli old model that Simi was heavily involved in, she's with you now, was one curricular hour a week, ongoing. 
Yeah. Are you still trying to reach that or let no. go of that? No, we let go of that because we don't believe we can make uh, teachers, mindfulness teachers in, in 30 hours, you know. So, but we do think that they can um, become, they can do contemplative pedagogies. So things that are regarded to being able to be present, to be able to um, stop, to inquire, to look inside, mindful listening, um, um, being able to contemplate, you know, about, you know, what does it mean for me? You know, I hear a poem, how do I meet the poem? These kind of things we think that teachers can be doing, but um, we, I mean, we do give teachers that want the ability to actually lead formal meditative practice for kids. This is one of the possibilities, but we don't expect it. And we also don't expect a um, curriculum time for that because as we both know, you and I in the education system in Israel at the moment, it's not simple to have an hour for that. So um, the, the, the idea is that the kids should have purple, should feel the purple every hour. We say, Every class is also a, um, I, know, I don't know how you call it in English, but in Hebrew, we have, you know, the home teacher class. That's like the, so it's like every class should also be a home class in terms that the, 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 the kid should meet herself in every class. Doesn't matter if it's math or geography. So it's more that the, the idea is that we, that we give a lot of doses of mindfulness for the adults but the kids should have more contemplative pedagogies and not specifically mind, like formal mindfulness training. Thank you. Okay, now there's one more question from Wolfgang, which I think we better make fairly brief because we want to give Nava more time. You've got more to say, I think, Nava. So yeah. Wolfgang, do you want to just pop in your question quickly and then we'll yes. go on? Because we've yes, got so. an hour and 15 minutes in all, that's all, and we've, we've used sort of um, three quarters of an hour so far. All right. Go, go uh, thank, it, thank you. Very quickly um, about um, communication practices. I'm just purely curious whether there is anything um, in the trainings or in the classrooms in part of uh, part of your program that um, that there are any kinds of specific uh, communication practices that you could call mindful communication practices, such as counsel, for instance, or something related to inside dialogue, or such as. Uh, something like counsel, for instance, counsel, the way of counsel, or you know, circle-based communication practices where you pass on the talking piece and keep listening, keep sharing, and so on. <laughs> Which I feel, although it's like not, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. maybe you you can say something. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in Israel, I don't think you'll see kids passing. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's a you know, in Israel, we're talking about four you know, 36 kids in a class, stuff like that, right? It's a little bit more challenging. But um, we have the idea in the, in the pedagogies that the teachers learn in the mindfulness in school program, um, uh, training. For example, there's a lot of mindful listening. There's a lot of um, practices where contemplative practices where ch children share. So they... Um, they do some sharing, a lot of sharing and mindful listening. So they share about their experiences and their list and mindful listening. And um, in, in addition, we also, this is something that we're still thinking how to incorporate. But like I said, we, all, we have all this module about how to do, how to lead discussions, how to be in a discussion, which is um, a controversial. So how can I be in controversial discussion? So we have that so in the in the in the in the at the moment, this is something we're developing in the side and researching on the side. But the idea is that at some point it will go into the uh, mindful in the purple schools as also part of the practices. It's just something that we're still developing and and researching. That's the grant I told you from the Mind and Life that we have this program where we give teachers the skills to um, be able to teach kids how to lead um, um, controversial discussions. Um, and with mindfulness tools, um, not only mindfulness tools, but mindfulness tools and um, nonviolent communication tools and stuff like that. Great, thank you. And also, you know, in, in, in Israel, there's already a lot of things happening. For example, there's um, circles of, of communication and stuff like that. So we, we teach the 
we teach the, the school how to color it in purple. Okay, so things that are already happening, like all kinds of social emotional things that you know are coming from the educational system, but usually they're not implemented very nicely. So we take them and we, we help them color that in purple. So we don't change or move things away. The idea is that we're coloring the school in purple. The school, the school could be Arabic school, it could be religious school, it could be, you know, there could be different schools, but we give the color to everything in purple. So that's the contemplative. So it's, that's why it's not like we're bringing a curriculum. We're, we're helping everything become just more contemplative. Right. Now, no, okay. no, we've got um, we've got half an hour left, which is great. So yeah, I, I don't need. I think um, I I think I'll be finished before. I mean, I I don't have a lot of slides okay. left. Well, I'll, I'll leave I'll leave it to you to how you manage the time. I just wanted to flag that up for you. So do you okay. want to go on with your content and then give us a give us a bit more time for Q and A? Yeah, your exactly. Yeah. So I'll I'll talk a little bit more and then I'll stop and we can um talk about the second part. So the second part is like I I told you was to say okay. So we so here is the like more or less what we want to do in a school. And it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite a lot of work inside a school. It's three years of going to school and working many hours, like you see, nice. But, you know, if at the end we can do it in 10 schools or in 15 schools, from my point of view, yeah, as a, someone that's spending her time instead on writing my, I mean, I also try to write my grants, but, you know, instead of doing other things, it's, you know, this is not, you know, I'm not a uh, education person. I'm, I'm, you know, from this point, I'm, 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 I'm a, this is like a social activity that I'm trying to do. So um, for me, it's interesting to understand how do we scale this thing? How do we do, how we do we go deep and broad? Because it's a little bit like in quantum mechanics, right? It's like, you can either do this or that. You can either, you know, I mean, the moment you measure, right, then things are not are not distributed anymore. So this is like, I think this is like, um, um, you know, it's like some kind of assumption that can you can either go deep or broad. You can either do a lot, like a lot of schools, but like very um, basic things. Or if you go deep, like we're trying to do, then you probably can't, you know, really scale. And for me, I would like to question this and ask, does it have to be like this? Can we find a way to go deep and broad? Um, and that means, can we find a way to find an effective whole school program, you know, which hopefully our program is an effective whole school program, but it can also remain effective when we go to scale. Can it become? Can it remain sustainable? And can we continue to have, um, you know, serious implementation and have it have it implemented well? So this is a big question, and I think it's an intriguing question. And um, I just want to say that, you know, there, that in the literature in the last few years, it's also a question that's brought up a lot about implementation and sustainability. And here's a a paper that actually Nimrod is also one of the authors that came out about planning about uh, implementation of social emotional learning. And here I just like, you know, uh, I just uh, did uh, uh, pictures of, 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 of parts of the paper where they say, without adequate planning for implementation, the benefits of an otherwise promising program or initiative may not be achieved. An effective implementation requires adaptation to suit the specific context in which the cell initiative is being undertaken. So, you know, you, you, you work in a few schools and everything goes great, but, um, but then, you know, every school has its own context, own universe, right? And how do you, how can you um, adapt yourself to so many schools once you're going to, you're going to scale? So for this, we created, two structures in the organization. Um, one is the Purple Lab and the other is the Purple Network. Um, I'll say something brief about the Purple Network and then I'll focus on the Purple Lab. So the Purple Network, the idea is that, you know, people when they, right, when we have our mindfulness practice or our contemplative practice, 
then the Sangha, right, the group <laughs> that we practice is really important for supporting the practice and not going back. Um, it's actually in every everything when people do a diet and uh, you know everything they always the support the group the the environment can be very supportive. So one of the understandings is first of all that to have sustainability of things we want to um, also work on the ecosystem. So first of all, of course, the purple schools should be a network that supports each other, that's in a community that supports each other. But also, how do we create um, how do we uh, color the ecosystem in Israel in purple, right? And um, just an example, we have now a collaboration with um, Oren Ergaz, which is also part of the CE, um, and we're trying to create a master's program for education people um, in mindfulness and social emotional learning. So that so to create, you know, to have people that will in the future be able to lead purple schools, for example, who go to go into purple schools. And we try to do a lot of collaborations with the Ministry of Education, but also with a lot of other things in the ecosystem. Um, and also learn the ecosystem because there, there's it's so complicated to really understand, you know, how the things work and where, which are the places that can really be supportive for schools. Like, for example, is the city level uh, supportive? Is the, um, is the district level? The most you know supportive so we really try to learn so um what and we really um do a lot of experiments in order to understand which is the level that could be most supportive that's the purple network but i think the most interesting thing is the purple lab so the purple lab is 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 the r d lab and a lot of the things that i showed you will happen in the d the development that's where the development thing of, of all the of all the interventions but there's, there's also the R. The R is actually the evaluation. And one of the things that we understand is that actually for, for to be able to scale, we really have to have a data-driven um, and flexible platform. So we have to have a lot of um, ways to gain um, information about what's happening. And, and once you have a lot of information, you can actually um, you can attend, you can, you can um, um, respond to things that are happening um, and address various school contexts. So the Purple Lab is actually developing a lot of tools to be able, first of all, you know, to be able to map the school context, to be able to understand, you know, what are the um, weaknesses, what are the strengths, what is the relationship in schools, what are the places, the hot spots in the schools, what are the um, um, conditions, and be able to track them and respond to them. So, you know, so, so um, that's one of the things. And the second thing is really have ability to um, implement continuous improvement cycles that can support the successful implementation. So go, going back to Brigitte's question, for example, in the beginning, one of the things that we all deal with is motivation and the question of motivation. And until now, what we, we, we always did, we went into a school, we gave you know, the best we can, and we hoped that most of the people will be motivated. What we're trying to do is to actually um, use um, continuous improvement cycles where we probe the interventions every two weeks, something like that, and actually check what are what is the situation of the, of the teachers in terms of um, things that are supposed to be underneath motivation, which according to self-determination theory would be how, how, how much they feel connected, related in, in the program, how much they feel competent, and how much they feel autonomous. And then we try to address this. And we, so the idea is to really try to keep a, a, a most of the participants in a feeling that these needs are fulfilled, that they feel autonomous, they understand why they're doing things, they feel that it's actually something that they can choose to do, that they feel um, competent to do what they're asked to do, 
and they feel connected and related to, to the group and what's happening. And um, um, just to give you an example, um, we're doing, this is like something new and um, we um, had um, a, a group that uh, um, the, uh, we gave the, the group this um, questionnaire and it came back that some of the, that some of the people actually don't feel connected. And the, one of the reasons was that there was teachers that were more senior and were more time in the, in the program and new teachers that came in and they didn't really understand what's happening. So the, so the instructor said in the next lesson, she said, you know what? We're going to have pairs of people um, and she did, I don't remember, uh, no, I don't remember how she called them. She had this uh, game, she, she, it was like a game. Um, she called them- She calls uh, it a, a buddy system. Yeah, it's like a buddy system. So the more senior um, were paired to the more, to, and it really changed the whole dynamics, okay? So she could do that because she had data from us telling her that people, and you know, she's a great instructor. She's one of our great instructors, but sometimes you don't know, right? So you do the best you can, and then you discover that some of the people really enjoyed, and some of the people didn't, were not connected, are not motivated. Um, in another group of, of in another group, um, um, uh, they, it came up that people don't feel that they're that they have enough competency to do what they're asked to do by the instructor. You know, she gives them like homework to practice things either by themselves or in all kinds of situations and they didn't feel competent. So the instructor understood that she has to slow down and she actually broke down things into smaller steps um, to make them feel more competent. Um, and this is, I think, you know, this is for us, it was understanding how much data and short cycles could be effective because, um, because a lot of, sometimes you have teachers that are very connected and they like the idea and they want to be there, but they don't have, they don't feel competent and they lose motivation. They come out of the intervention and they don't know what to do. And when you have the information online and you can actually um, respond to that on time, then there's greater chances that you finish the intervention and you have much more people on board with you for the next stage. So um, for us, one, so when we think about how we scale and how we, how we, you know, how we um, um, take care of implementation and sustainability, we, are, we understand we have to build a lot of abilities inside our organization to have different kinds of cycles in different kinds of stages that will actually help us understand, you know, how much people are on board and what we need to keep them on board. Um, and, um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, what is happening in the school and how we can respond to that. So one day when we will have, I don't know, a lot of schools and not all the instructors would be the best instructors that we have right now. The idea would be that we will have data coming in and then we will be able to say, okay, this is what's happening. You have, this is what we suggest to do. You have one, two, three, four, five, you know, options to do. That would be part of the development of the Purple Lab would be not only to how do we, not, not, not only how do we measure, but also how do we, what are the options to respond um, and be able to adapt flexibly to the needs that are actually there in the specific school. So I just want to say, um, to finish and say that um, we can, you know, we're, we're learning that on one hand, we're feeling that this is, um, have a, has a lot of potential but we also understand that there's a lot of challenges. And I just wanna share with you a few of the challenges. So the first challenge is to ask, what do you measure in these short cycles? It took us a lot of time because social emotional capacities, they don't change over one week or two weeks, right? I mean, they can, but it's very hard to measure that. Mindfulness is not something you can measure over one or two weeks. 
So what do you measure every two weeks to understand what's happening? And this is how we realize that what you need to measure is the needs. It's, it's something much more basic. You need to, 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 to measure if the person is feeling that their, that their needs are fulfilled in this setting. They feel, you know, like I said, related, they feel competent and they feel autonomous. That's what we need to measure. Um, I mean, that's what we think, <laughs> because I mean, I would be happy to hear from other people what you think you can measure in every two weeks to be able to really, you know, know what's happening from moment to moment inside an intervention of 30 hours. Um, of course, there's a lot of other things you can, like in the, in the more advanced interventions, we also, we, we put a lot of emphasis on competence, you know, um, and um, actually, you know, we also have peer, peer, um, um, uh, peer evaluations and all, but the idea is that, so, so that's a big question. What do you measure this? And, and in what frequency do you measure? This is a very big question. The second big question is um, that we discovered is that a lot of mindfulness people, you know, the greatest people that you have on your team don't like the word data. They don't like the word evaluation. And when you bring in evaluation, the, the first thing they do is contract. So there's a lot of work as an organization to bring in a culture of evaluation that understands that evaluation is actually mindfulness, right? When we sit and close our eyes and do mindfulness, we're actually doing an evaluation, but it's not a it's not the regular evaluation that says, are you good or bad? It's the evaluation that says, what is the situation right now? And how can I, what can I do to make it more beneficial, right? This is mindfulness practice. And um, we, and it took us time. And um, happily, we found that a lot of the instructors that really didn't like this idea of evaluation, of, of, of us, you know, asking the participants about their needs, they came back and they said, wow, you know, it really helped me. Suddenly I was able to see things that I couldn't see before, but it takes time and we can say, and we can, you know, we can offer suggestions here. You need to really do some kind of a process with the team to be able to bring in um, evaluation. And um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll, you know, just, just to, for, to remind myself, but also um, ah, one of the things we understand that the next step would be to create purple labs inside the schools themselves. So the schools will become, the, so they will, so the schools will say, wow, it's really great to have this information all the time where I'm not evaluating if things are good or bad, but I'm ask, just saying, is, is, are things working are people feeling that their needs are fulfilled? Are people, are, pe are people feeling supported? And the idea is to actually bring this inside the schools themselves and not only be an external value, external thing. And there's a lot of other dilemmas just to share, you know, the like dilemmas of, um, you know, cultural adaptation. Now we have a, a Arab school, you know, how much cultural adaptation should be there and we're working on that. Um, you know, what are the conditions to enter a school? If you want to go broad, then do you go to every school or do you still have, you know, conditions um, where you say, you know, I'm, there's schools that I don't go into. For example, we learned in the process that very, very big schools like high schools in Israel, um, it's like huge factories, you know, there's like 180 teachers, very hard to, to, to have impact there, um, the way, the way things work in Israel right now, where you can't go simultaneously to work with all the teachers you have, you know, you, you only have a um, few hours or stuff like that. So um, that's questions that we have a lot of dilemmas around. And then we also have like, you know, the role of the program in the bigger picture. Um, can we, can we give the purple, the purpleness to other programs? And do we, you know, maybe that maybe the whole point of our program is actually the purple and um, other other programs that are already running and doing fabulous things can take just the color, right? The, the ideas of how to bring in the color. And so these are all kinds of dilemmas that we're working with. 
Great. So that's like the, the main things I want to share right now. Um, and I um, you know everything here is really ongoing. And I'm sure that in about one year, I'll have much more um, experience and um, um, things I can share about this process of trying to bring in um, data-driven development and um, implementation. Um, so, but already now, if anyone wants to, you know, to be in contact, I'll be happy. And, and I think let's, let's have the, the time that's left for some questions and discussion. Okay, yes. You've answered the question I had, Nava, I think, which is how do you engage participants in the research process itself? And I think yeah. you've highlighted that that's the million dollar question sometimes. So they don't just feel things are being done to them and they're being judged. You know, this exactly. is the irony of mindfulness. We're trying to be non judgmental, but assess at the same time how we do. Um, so that's, I think you've answered that one. The idea of getting the purple lab into the school itself is fascinating. Yeah, and the purple leaders have a very significant um, uh, part here because they can really um, help. I mean, with the, when we bring in the language of needs and you know, all the levels say to themselves, like the principal needs to ask herself, first of all, in, are my needs fulfilled? You know, and mindfulness also as a way to, to help me fulfill my needs. Of course, you know, the ecosystem usually frustrates her needs, right? But um, we, that's not a place where we can control right now. But then do I fulfill the needs of my staff or do I frustrate it? So this is part of the things she does in the mindful leadership. And the mindful leaders, they do the same thing also. And then the teachers ask themselves, you know, um, 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 are, are, are the needs of my kids fulfilled, right? So for the kids to be open for mindfulness and social emotional learning, and to have motivations for these things, they have to be, they have to feel connected, they have to feel autonomous, they have to feel capable. Um, so the moment this we, we introduce this language into the school, then um, then we can say, you know, when we're asking you questions, we want to know if you're okay. We're not judging you, we just want to know that you're okay. And that changes, you know, the way people see um, the, the questionnaires and everything. But I have to say, it's not simple. Catherine, you probably know. I mean, it's, it's a process. It's a cultural change. You know, people um, in schools are so much evaluated all the time that to help them see that sometimes evaluation is for them and not against them. It's something that you need to work on. Yes, absolutely. They're so accountable very often to inspectors and so on. It just feels like another judgment. Okay, and anyone got any comments? It would be lovely. Just just fling them out if you have. Just unmute yourself and throw them in. Wolfgang was obviously yeah. enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have one more question. I was really intrigued by this um, these six stages that you also shared in the beginning, in the first half about uh, which started with the basic needs and then filling up mindfulness, da da da, SEL, uh, ultimately the cultural change of, of schools and. and mm. Um, and and the, it, it seems apparent to me that uh, it's like every stage is only effective to the extent that it helps fulfill these basic needs or increasingly helps doing so. But is this really generally, uh, would you agree? Or is this generally true? Or might it be that at some point you maybe have to go through a kind of valley where it's it seems like you're making backward progress? And, uh, or is it always like, it should always kind of go up? Yeah, th this is a, a huge question, Wolfgang, because as we know, um, you know, somewhere in lesson three or four, right, out of eight or nine, so usually um, participants in a mindfulness class usually have some kind of a valley, right? And then when they come out of the valley, then that's where they have the aha, right? That's where the, um, and I think that, um, um, also addressing that, right, as saying, um, the, there is a stage, I mean, this is okay that now you feel confused, this is part of the process. You know, this is a question we really asked ourselves about that, you know, um, and this is also why we thought that maybe we need to, um, like, it, uh, when do you probe? When do you probe the, so if you know that from your experience that usually there's a valley somewhere, then maybe you can probe after that valley and say, that's where I, I mean, at this point, I do expect people to be coming out of this valley 
um, and having some kind of a deep insight and more connected. And if they're not, or some of them are not, that's where I want to do something to have everybody on board because that's where also you lose part of your group, right? So that's where the, the early adapters really, really do a jump forward. But the ones that are left behind, usually you, you lose them. And the idea is really to find a way where you're moving everybody uh, forward, knowing that you know this valley is, is a place where you really have to be sensitive to how people are coming out. But again, this is the work in progress, but uh, I think it's a very important point what you said. And we, we had a big discussion about that because some of the instructors said, I know that in lesson three, that's where I would, uh, people would say, I don't feel competent enough. Um, or I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. And it's okay, I want them to be lost there because after that they will have understanding and and we had a, a lot of discussion about, you know, and then we said maybe then maybe we need to, to, do, to do the probing, you know, a lesson after that. Okay. But work in progress, we're still learning how to do it. I think, by the way, that if more groups would have been doing these things, we, this is something we can learn from each other because it, there is some kind of a dynamics in, in, in you know, mindfulness uh, practices, right? And it would be really interesting to understand this. Um, from the point of view of self-determination theory, so if people here are doing some research, they know the MASS, the MASS questionnaire, the M-A-A-S questionnaire, it was actually developed by one of the people, um, Ryan, which is one of the um, developers of the self-determination theory. So the theory is really related to mindfulness. And the idea is that <clears throat> basics, basic needs support mindfulness, but mindfulness supports basic needs. It's like a it's like a circle, <clears throat> but I, I agree with you. Very, very good question. Very good point. Okay, I'm going to gently draw things to an end here because I think we said an hour and 15 and it's always good to finish on time. And I, I want to do two things. One is to thank Nava enormously for what I knew was going to be a fascinating presentation and, and it was, it's so rich and there's so much to, the, the more we'd like to know. So thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you in a year's time when you've, when you've cracked some of your challenges. But uh, really interesting for me because we're developing similar work in the UK and the parallels are enormous. So thank you. And I'd just like as well just to um, give Cornelius a moment because this might be the last time we see him as a CCE. I don't know. I don't know if uh, Cornelius, you want to say anything or I think we'd certainly like to, to thank you. whether he's frozen I, I, I don't know can um, i does... say something until yeah. he is unmuted yeah i, just I put to... it in the comments but i want to nava to absolutely hear it maybe she didn't see it that your presentation really helps me a lot yeah. thank you so yeah. much nava. Yeah. thank you and i think maybe others maybe sala wants to say something as a fine and and if you like to proceed yeah. i can stay a little bit longer on i don't know i know that sala I is also longer, so yeah. just offering that and my personal point nava thank you for pointing out there is a need and uh, mindful of uh, that that also the leadership in there is so so important i think that's it's very good to yeah, to, to practice what what will be preached or what it is so important, I think everything. So it's not only in schools, it's in the whole society for thank you for it. But now maybe someone else wants to say something. Yeah, well, we could just, we started by each of us saying something. So if people just want to pop some thoughts I'm in. back. You're back. Sorry. Three. I'm back. Yeah, I think that's a line I learned from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Didn't he say that? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but I... He said, I will be back. But maybe yeah, you come back as a managing director. I don't know whenever, so just, no. just be careful. <laughs> but I, I see my internet uh, is unstable, so um, give me a heads up if, 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 if I freeze. I'll keep it really short. First of all, Nava, thank you. It's, it's fascinating and, and, and good luck with the, with the continuing development of, of your work. Um, uh, you know, great to have projects like these around. I think, you know, um, I'm not going away that quickly because I'm going to work in the new MD in January. So I'll be around and coaching and, you know, um, and possibly even into February. So I'm not going to completely drop off the face of the planet. Um, I think, you know, what I want to say, and this is more personally, is um, 
you know, for me, the work that you're all doing and that we're trying to do together in the CCE is um, one of the really the main uh, priorities for Mind and Life Europe. It's one of our the main focus areas for, for our so-called hub activity. And, um, you know, when you look at the world around us and all the big problems, you know, of course, we it's completely overwhelming. And if we break it down a little bit, I think um, at least the way I see things is the work that we're trying to do in developing a more holistic view of education, a deeper understanding of the individual and the education that is fostering empathy and compassion and kindness. Um, this on a long-term basis is really kind of what, what society really needs. You know, it's not gonna be the politicians or the bankers or I don't know whom we're gonna solve the problems of anything that'd be worse. So, um, you know, even when we get daunted or maybe uh, depressed or it's, you know, it seems like an uphill battle or it's not mainstream, I think the work is just so important. Um, and, and I feel that way. And I, I, I think you, each of you do as well. And I do feel that there's strength in numbers, you know, even if it's more time and it's commitment and we have lots of other things to do, the fact that we know of each other, that we're connected with each other, that we can share and be inspired by each other, I think is really, um, you know, it's really what we want to do with the CCE. So thanks for participating, stay participating. Um, you know, uh, we want to grow this together with you. And thank you all and good wishes for the holiday season. Thank you, Colleen. Take some rest. Lovely. Or as, as Uta would say, anyone who wants think, to I don't know, we started with this. Yeah. I, I wanted to pull out this card. We have these value cards. This is for the holiday season. It's the take care card. Right. Yeah. Catherine, you have the last word. <laughs> yes, I so often do, I'm afraid. Thank <laughs> no, just to thank you, Cornelius, for those words. It's very cheering to, to feel that Mind and Life Europe appreciates the, the community that we that we built here. And if, I would also like to say thank Uta and Nina, who do so much wonderful background work of keeping this going. And, you know, it's without them. It, we would all fall apart. So I think that's that's lovely. And I guess to wish everybody a rather early but a peaceful break over the over the winter. Winter solstice, Christmas, whatever you celebrate with you and yours in whatever numbers you're allowed to gather. <laughs> Let's try and make it a peaceful and happy time. And here's to a better 2021. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you for everything you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All the best. Till next year. Till next year. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was double checking. I, yeah. I, Sala, you still want to have a question or something? It seems like I, you, you yeah, want to I, exchange. Yeah, yeah. I just, no, I wanted to thank you, Nala, for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. And it's so many questions and, and thoughts arise. It really resonated with me. I, I need to structure a little bit my mind, but I would really like to take, uh, write to you and yeah, continue that is a discussion. It's, it's wonderful work what you do, really. I admire your, your work and the Purple Project and good luck with it. So here I'm, I'm writing my email and you're like really welcome to, um, to write and um, we'll be really ha um, happy to share and give more information. You know, I mean, we're on the path. It's not like we reached the, the holy grail, but um, I think we, learned so many we did so many mistakes also that we can mm. also you know have share you know the the understandings of what not to do or what probably to do thank you and and now if i may um when i send out the recordings to the rest of the group i hope it's okay that i say that nava is is waiting for your uh, input or questions and i just add your email address also yeah, there, and so. i'll send you i'll send you the presentation also oh, perfect yeah thank yeah, you right. and perhaps perhaps so you can capture the book that nimrod suggested yeah. would be helpful that's really lovely good i i will add also the chat so um oh smashing yeah thank you. Always on the Dropbox. Okay. Okay. So, thank you all for coming and um, giving your input, and hope to be in contact and collaborate. Take care. Yes, Very much. You. Looking forward to it. Thank, thank you, you, Nava. Bye. Bye. Happy holiday. Bye. Happy thank Hanukkah. You. Enjoy. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Nava. Bye.
I will Bye. close the meeting for all. So thank you. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, Wolfgang. <laughs> 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 Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>